Hello and welcome to the Chooseify Radio Podcast. Today on the show, Tyler calls in to challenge us on our limiting beliefs about the cost of golf. Jason calls in to ask about travel rewards updates for 2018. And Tay calls in to ask what the roadmap to Fi would look like. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Well, I can't wait to hop in and talk about this past week's episode with Jillian, Montana Money Adventure. What a powerful episode, and there's so much to talk about. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing really, really well. This episode with Jillian was just fantastic. I know I, I say this fairly often, like, oh, this episode was in my top 10 or, or something like that, but this one might have been my favorite episode. I just was absolutely enthralled with her story and all the tips she had to pass along for living a better life. And I was just really, really impressed. And yeah, Jonathan, what's going on in my real life here is I think my car might be on the way out. It's a little bit scary here. No, Golden Boy taking one for the team. Do you remember that uh, that Seinfeld episode? No, no, no. Tell me. <laughs> well, Jerry Seinfeld has a favorite shirt, right? I mean, he has a favorite shirt that he has held on to for years and years. And eventually, as with all things, it disintegrates, right? And so he has to replace it with baby blue, uh, his second favorite shirt. So the question is, because you have a Honda, you have a 2003 Honda. In theory, you could keep this thing running for the next thousand years. How far are you going to push it? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of not at that point yet. I've noticed the car is just not functioning as well as it used to. And I, in the last couple of days, noticed a little gas smell kind of right outside the passenger wheel well in the rear of the car. And, you know, obviously anytime you smell gas, it's not a good thing. And it just seems like some things are breaking down and it's a little bit frustrating. Like, A, I don't know anything about cars, so that's kind of a bad situation. But B, I've built part of my FI identity around this wonderful 2003 Honda Civic. And I don't really want to give it up. And that's warring with, well, dummy, how much money are you going to spend putting into a car that's 15 years old? It's a kind of a weird conundrum. And and I'm getting way ahead of myself here because I, I literally just brought the car into the shop about an hour ago. So if you hear a phone ringing in the background, that's them calling to tell me what's going on. But yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on on like how much money to sink into an old car? Like, have you ever thought about that in your analysis? Well, a couple of things come to mind and there's a lot of different directions. I actually want to take this because this is a fascinating conversation and historically I've been so bad at cars, but we did that episode. It was episode 22, the true cost of car ownership. So let's first of all, just talk about the fact that you've had this car. I think you bought it. Did you buy it brand new? I bought it brand new in August of 2003. So, I mean, it's literally coming up on 15 years, almost to the day. What was the purchase price back when you got it? I don't remember the precise dollar, but it was like $15,000 plus or minus a couple hundred. All right. So it's a Honda. So they will always have some value until they literally have no tires on there and there's no engine in there that you're always going to be able to sell it for something. So if you were to sell it, you would probably get a floor of what, around $1,000, $2,000, something like that. Oh, I would think at least, I mean, there's less than 120,000 miles on it. So yeah, it wouldn't shock me if I could sell it for who knows two to 5,000. I I don't really know precisely, but yeah. Okay. So two to $5,000. So your cost of car ownership just from a depreciation level is, you know, roughly right around 10 to 12 K. So it's cost you 10 to 12 K to have that car over the last, gosh, wow, 15 plus years, which what we found out is that when you add in all of the different factors for car ownership, which we clearly didn't do with your scenario, but like when you go get the brand new car, that's the gas guzzler and and you take, you add into it, the depreciation, the insurance, the gas on average, the individual is it's costing them around $7,000 a year to drive that big gas guzzling vehicle. So you've been at basically a, a small fraction of that. For this period of time. But then the question is, if you were to go purchase a new one, 
what would you get? Now, clearly you're in a financial situation where you would need to finance a car at this point. You would likely just end up paying cash for it unless the economics were so compelling, like the interest rate's so low and you're able to get such a great deal. But, but I think what I came away with was not just how much is a car costing you, but like how to win with car ownership. And I think that you take a huge hit when you buy it brand new. I would say that the depreciation slows after, you know, three or four years, but I mean, if you're willing, you could, I mean, if you were to get like a 2010, 2011 Toyota or a Honda, I mean, that would be probably the ideal scenario. You have something that's likely going to run for another 10 to 15 years. If you were able to get something that has relatively low mileage on it, you know, that's obviously going to make that more viable. Your repair costs are so astronomically low and your resale value are high. You tie that to something that's a gas sipper. You know, it may or may not be a hybrid, but just because Toyotas and Hondas are so efficient, you know, you get something that like a Honda Fit. I don't know. You got that little hatchback tied into it. That that to me kind of seems like in my mind, having just been horrible with cars all this time, kind of the the mental model I work into. What do you think? Yeah, no, that all makes sense. And I've just been doing just a tiny little bit of research on this. And it looks like I could get a brand new Civic, no frills. I mean, I don't I don't want anything in my car, but it, it probably 18, 19,000, something like that. But then you look on a site like CarMax and you can get a used one with 60,000 miles for only 14 to 16,000. Then in my head, I'm like, shouldn't I just get the new car? I mean, I know that goes against everything I stand for, but that's not how I live my life. I don't live my life coming up with some theory and, and being pigheaded about it. It's just okay, does it make sense to pay the extra couple thousand bucks for a brand new car that has 60,000 fewer miles on it? So these are things that I'm grappling with and I, I'd love to get feedback from the audience, frankly. And I mean, hopefully this doesn't come to pass. Hopefully I get a call in the next hour from the shop and it's $300 to fix some hose and, and I'm on my way. But if it's two grand or three grand, then we've got a decision point, right? Like it's hard to throw $3,000 into a 15 year old car and then I come to this point of what do I do? Unfortunately, like the economics seem to be not as clear cut as I would have hoped. And what we had seen with Laura's Highlander when we bought it was she basically did exactly what you're describing. She got it more or less 50% off the retail price by just buying, I think at that point it was four years old with only like 30,000 miles. I think it was 27,000 miles. And she got it for 16K instead of 32K, which is what it would have cost approximately new. So, I mean, that was a clear slam dunk, but it's not as obvious with the Civic. So, yeah, it's something I fear I'm going to struggle with. I think it's interesting to talk about context of what this financial choice for you in terms of your car will actually mean for your financial situation, because there's many of many of us, most of us, myself included, or on the path to FI. Every financially related choice that we make has a greater impact because it affects our ability to reach the point in time where we've created this perpetual money-making machine. But there is a point in time at which you have created that perpetual money-making machine. Your money is now earning enough money for you. And probably at some point, it's really, it's earning more for you than you even need. And I'm wondering, as you're kind of battling with how much to spend on this vehicle, obviously you're still making a very practical choice. You know, you're not talking about a 40 or $50,000 car. You're talking about a 10 to $20,000 car, and you could easily just pay for this cash at this point. You still view it as utilitarian vehicle. It's still a point to get from A to B, but the nuances don't, don't matter as much. Does that, is that kind of weighing into your decision? Huh? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Jonathan. And I hate to like minimize it, but yeah, I mean that $3,000 difference kind of, as you're alluding to here, it just, it doesn't matter quite as much as it would have five or 10 years ago. And clearly I don't want to minimize this issue for other people who are trying to save up those $3,000 or are trying to get out of debt. I mean, that's the whole beauty of this FI journey is that we're all at different places. That all said, I'm still a valuist at heart and I always will be no question about it. And like you said, I would never buy a 40 or $50,000 car. That's just not something that would ever cross my mind. But not only that, even just making a 15 or $18,000 purchase is difficult for me. It's not something that I want to do, but I can take that step back from a position of financial strength and power and say, what is the best long-term decision for me? And I think that's where this is coming in. So is it a better long-term decision to buy 
a used Honda Civic for roughly fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars with sixty thousand miles on it, and who knows what wear and tear, who knows what the owner was like previously, or a brand new one with zero miles on it for just three to four thousand dollars more. So I think that is where the decision comes down. It's not the finances. And I understand I'm in an extraordinarily fortunate position to be there, right? And to not worry about those three or $4,000, but to look from the value and what makes more sense for me long-term. So, I mean, does, does that make sense as far as reasoning goes? Yeah. You know, as I was even thinking back again to the episode that we referenced, episode 22, the true cost of car ownership, I think anybody listening to this needs to go listen to that first for more context. As I remember, we kind of put together you know, two different pieces to talk about that. We we had your piece, which is talking about how bad it is for your finances to manage the payments over extended period of time, always upgrading your car into the next car over a period of 20, 30, 40 years. And then I was adding into this, you know, the unseen cost of car ownership. And we kind of tied those together. But even in the early days for you, it wasn't so much buy a used car as much as buy a car, never sell it until it disintegrates into nothing. And you've kind of lived that out. You've had this one very economical choice car, this Honda for 15 years now. And because you didn't, after three or four years, upgrade to the next one and then continue that $250 a month payment or $300 a month payment, you have that, I mean, that that one choice over a 30, 40 year period has been worth literally a million dollars. Yeah. And it's funny because when I set up that original article way back when on my old site, richmondsavers.com, I set it up as having car payments for five years, then no car payments for 10 additional years, basically owning the car for 15 years and just doing that basically three times in a 45 year period. That's kind of where I am right now. I haven't had a car payment in 10 years. I've owned my car for almost 15 years to the day. So of course, I'm hoping that the car's fine and I can have it for another 10 years, right? So clearly I'm not looking to make this a self-fulfilling prophecy that, oh, I only have it for 15 years and I junk it. I mean, the ideal scenario is I never buy a new car again, but it is interesting that I have not made a car payment in 10 years. So it's not about managing the payments for me. Certainly it's not about, about anything. It's just about, do I have that need? And then okay, if there is a need for a new car, if it doesn't make sense to pour more money into this old car, then what's the best value for me long-term? I think that's, that's where my decision comes down. Yeah. And what's really cool is just in that one frame, in that one interim, right? From the beginning, when you purchase that car till now, the end of this 15 year run, you have reached financial independence. So it's kind of like you're testing your hypotheses out, but at the same time, you're benefiting from said hypotheses because You've hit five. Yeah, I love that. And not terribly coincidentally that I hit five because I made a lot of decisions like that, that just set up the structure of my entire life that just doesn't cost that much. So that was my five journey is making a couple of these big decisions on housing, on car, on food, on cutting down my phone expenses. Those things created a significant margin in our lives that enabled us to save tens of thousands of dollars a year without batting an eyelash and without making our lives this point of deprivation or or anything negative. It was just these couple of little decisions and we still have lovely cars. We still lived in this fantastic four bedroom house in the nicest part of the entire Richmond metro area. So like this is not an oh poor me scenario. It's just making slightly optimized decisions and having it work out over a 15 year period. Well, I'm rooting for Golden Boy, but either way, uh, it's a really cool story. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for Golden Boy, too, here. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and talk about this past week's episode. As you pointed out, this was probably one of the more poignant episodes that I've ever participated in. And I kind of think about, as a listener, I, I can say this as a listener and as a reader of blogs, when I would read about somebody that accomplished something remarkable, in many cases, I would look to see if they had a similar story as myself, if there were different things about their story that I could relate to. So maybe I was looking at someone that had a similar income bracket or someone that was in a similar profession, someone that came from a similar background, grew up in a similar area, all these different things. It was truly remarkable with Jillian to see someone that you know, started at a below median income line and was willing to make radical choices, had a large family, 
was willing to basically do extended amounts of travel, found a way to save up and purchase a home cash. I mean, what she did, she towed the line on being willing to make hard choices. And when you look at her life now, you see directly how she benefited from that. But it leans into this concept that you have talked about many times, discipline equals freedom. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's become one of the unifying theories behind my entire life. I think about it all the time now. Discipline equals freedom. I absolutely love that. And it's it's just having that framework of discipline to do the right things structurally in your life that allow for freedom to do the things that you want to do. It's funny, like as it's pervaded my thought process, I I just see it more and more often. Even something as simple as we spent 45 minutes looking around our house for my daughter Molly's swim goggles because we didn't have the discipline to just put it into the bag right away like we should every single time because then we don't have to worry about that. I know that's a silly little example. It's just, it's doing the right things habitually to then allow yourself the freedom. We could have spent that 45 minutes playing a board game or reading together as a family or doing anything, right? But because we weren't disciplined, we lost that 45 minutes. And it was that was just really frustrating. And it's a tiny little example, but I think what Jillian has done, and it was in answer to my question of like, how did she get the audacity to do all this? And, and she said it was from resilience and grit. She said, these are some things I've learned to practice my entire life. And then she followed up with, how did she learn that grit and resilience? And she said that we need to cross train our life, learning to do difficult things in areas that are low risk, learn to become deeply uncomfortable with things. And when you're full of fear, but don't let it overwhelm our systems, she said. And I just absolutely love that. It's inoculating yourself against fear. It's putting yourself purposefully into uncomfortable situations so that you don't freak out right? You understand how to react in all sorts of uncomfortable and fearful situations by putting yourself into those situations, like she said, in low risk areas. I just thought that was a brilliant strategy for life. And these quotes, you know, obviously aren't originated by Brad and Jonathan, but that's fine. That's great. I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to always come up with the best idea yourself. It's seeing great ideas that other people have and then implementing in your own life. It's not just talking about it necessarily and saying, oh yeah, that's nice, but it's actually taking action with it. And that's what you saw Jillian did. There's this, there's this other quote that we've kind of mentioned several times. I think it's by Jersey Gregoric and it's easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life. If Jillian had just taken the most passive choice, the easiest choice. Her life would be so difficult right now. It it, it clearly required looking at it and saying, how can we get rid of good to make way for great? That requires drama. That requires her going to her kids and asking them and, and, and helping them make a decision to give something up. They had to give something up in order to make room for this lifestyle by design. But you go from hearing, wow, they have all these challenges. Wow, how are they going to make it from one week to the next to almost a little bit of envy? Wow, their life looks so intentional. How can I incorporate a piece of that into my own life? And the the reality is you can't unless you give up the good to make way for the great. And what I love about Jillian and what she's done on her site is she's taken all of these kind of hard choices that she that she's made and she's kind of built it into a framework and a lot of it involves conversation it requires difficult but important conversation and a lot of those conversations have some overlapping themes some overlapping questions and those questions are built on an underlying framework of what do you value She's actually provided uh, worksheets on her site that kind of has a list of the different types of questions she asked that have really moved them in this direction. There's the conversations that she has with her spouse, very intentional conversations. There's the questions that she has with the people that she mentors, where she's helping them grow in this particular area. And there's the conversations that she has with her children. I think all of us, whether you're an introvert or you're an extrovert, we all want to have deeper, more relevant conversations. And she has laid a groundwork for growing in this aspect of your life. Yeah, without a doubt. And I just love the way she described the life that her and Adam have built. It's just remarkable. I I was going through the episode taking notes and I just kept saying, wow, that's a brilliant quote. That's a brilliant quote. Like I have pages, Jonathan, of of these quotes. And when she was talking about they had to simplify by quitting and they only kept those things that were such high value that they couldn't live without them. How do they decide what to keep? They think about the next year 
and they sit down and they have these conversations before the year is up and they think about that upcoming year and figure out what's important and weigh it against what they are willing to sacrifice. And I think that is such an interesting way of looking at life that by saying yes to something, you are saying no to everything else in the world. It's funny because we don't really think about that. But when you say yes to filling up your time or taking away your resources, there is cost to that. That's the true essence of opportunity cost. So they weigh it against what are they willing to sacrifice? So that's the word she uses. And that is a really, really significant word, sacrifice. And then she talks about, again, these conversations, creating your ideal day, month, year, and then line it up with your current spending and your current schedule. And it's like a, a proof is in the pudding type scenario, right? She compares it and says, where is there a disconnect? These are the, the people that she mentors. Where is there that disconnect? If you say that this is important, if you say that this is part of your ideal day or week or month and you're not doing it, right? You're not spending time or resources on it. Well, there is a disconnect there. Is it truly a priority? If you can't make time for it. It just, it doesn't make sense. So I think it's important to take those steps back and really reflect on what do you want your life to look like? And then sacrifice what you need to do to make it happen. And that might mean giving up things that you just kind of like to do the things that you love. And that's a way to live life. And the feedback has started to trickle through on this particular episode. And I have a feeling, Brad, it's going to be one of those things where it continues to come in for the rest of the week. It's one of the only reasons that I regret the fact that we record our Friday roundups on Tuesday instead of on Thursday, because I can't tell you how many times we finish the roundup and then like five or six comments drop and you're like, oh, I wanted to include that. But this one came through from Chase and he says, maybe the best interview in the history of interviews. And I will say the credit for that is 100% Jillian. She just, her story just absolutely so compelling. The other thing that really stood out to me is how relevant it was for someone that has, you know, none of those exact same circumstances. Uh, And in particular, I'm thinking of some feedback that we got from Chad on this particular episode. And Chad said, This morning when I woke up and I downloaded the episode and I saw five kids and family minimalism. Hmm. I'm not going to be able to relate to this episode 40 minutes in and Brad, it's like you. He was like, I'm writing this down, writing that down. I got to remember that quote for later. That's a great quote. Yep. That's me too. I agree with that. Mind blown. This is a mindset episode. All of us struggle with the mindset game. I think that we have become increasingly aware that financial independence is more than hitting a 50% savings rate. It is a worldview. Your why of fi is infinitely more important than the how of fi. There's a million different ways to pursue it, but your mental game is what drives this thing. And if you're intentional with your life choices, everything else will fall into place after that. That is something that we're pursuing. It's kind of like one of those things that I was actually thinking about this more and more. I kind of want to build like this hierarchy of how, you know, there's these overarching kind of principles that make up the mindset of Phi. And then those kind of lead into the pillars of Phi. And it's kind of like this trickle down effect, because when you claim control in one aspect of your life and you kind of get off the grind, you get out of this drift state, you suddenly have control over that, obviously, but then all these other options open up to you and you start nailing down these other aspects and your life just gets better, which is why for us, you know, financial independence, it's a life optimization strategy. It's not just a financial strategy. It's a way of improving your life. Yeah. And Jonathan, like you said, the mindset is just so crucial. And we spend a lot of time at this point in the show talking about mindset because it is just, it really is everything to me. It's, it's 90% of the battle. It's once you get that why down, once you have the mindset straight of why you're living your life this way, why you want to save, what you want your life to be, then that's the important part. Then all everything else is easy, right? Saving money when you have your why is easy. Putting money into index funds, that's pretty straightforward. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. That kind of stuff is fairly, fairly easy. But that said, Jonathan, you you know, we have plenty of, of new listeners, right? And they may not have gone back and listened to the Pillars of Five from 100 plus episodes ago. And what I thought would be cool is if we took five minutes and just really talk through the basics of the actual nuts and bolts, which is kind of funny since I just led with mindset is so important, but I don't think we talk about the nuts and bolts that often. I'd love to hear if you were giving someone an elevator pitch, what would that look like in a few minutes? 
You know, it's so funny. The way you just framed that is exactly the voicemail that I just got from Tay. Wow. That's crazy. I obviously had no idea that was coming. So that's very, very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys are on the same page. Hey, guys, this is Tay from Alexander, Virginia. I love your podcast. And I like the fact that you go over different aspects of FI every week. I just want to know if there's a place where I could look at step by step where I could go from 0% FI to 100% FI. I've taken little tips here and there, but I really would like to know step by step if there's some sort of website or an organized step by step guide, could you recommend on your show? Thanks. Yeah, I tell you, this is fantastic. It's a perfect conversation point for us. I'll say that if you want something to read uh, on the website and obviously linked in the show notes for today's episode, we'll put a link to the article. Uh, we have one called The Beginner's Guide to Reaching Financial Independence. It is kind of, I think it's honestly, it's better than our Pillars of Fi article because while the Pillars of Fi gives you just 10 giant things that you can do, 10 giant levers that you can pull that will absolutely increase your your net worth by the six figures easily over the next 10 to 20 years, this is more just like do this, then this, then this. It's a little bit more stepwise. And that's kind of what you're asking for. I think one of the things that has made kind of setting out a roadmap to FI a little bit more difficult is that people are starting in different places. For instance, with Dave Ramsey, he's the get out of debt guy. So if you are the, if you're massively in debt, it's a little bit more focused. We just need to pay down the debt. But reaching a point where you don't have to work for money anymore, where you're financially independent, there are a lot more ways to tackle that. And it's not necessarily as myopic. Hey, we just need to pay off this debt. So I think there, I think this is kind of where we can tie in just a few mindset ideas and then a few actionable points to get started. With mindset, for me, the biggest thing is intentionality. So I like to think that you don't know what you don't know until you do. You just kind of start with that. And so, okay, I need to position myself to find out what I don't know. So you're listening to this podcast, you're listening to shows like this, you're reading you know, good material, good books, you're exposing yourself to good information and that's kind of changing your world frame. So that's one. The other is a growth mindset. You can be anybody that you want to be. You can learn anything that you want to learn. You are not a fixed entity. It's just a matter of are you willing to apply your mind to something other than staying caught up on Gray's Anatomy? The third aspect of this is the aggregation of marginal gain. So you're going to get, we don't, I don't care if you're not an expert tomorrow. We're just going to try to be a little bit better, you know, tomorrow than we were today and so on and so forth. And not just in one aspect, but in every aspect of our life. So Brad, for mindset, does that feel like low hanging fruit, kind of the, the three different things that kind of cover us from a mindset perspective? Yeah, I love that. That's a really, really great overview. And then you get into the nuts and bolts, right? Yeah, that just kind of sets us up. So nuts and bolts. The first thing is, in my mind, it's always just, where are we right now? Tracking our expenses. What does our life actually cost? Most people have no idea. And frankly, a lot of people think that this process is much more complicated than it really is. Um, I, I imagine if I were to think back, if you were to watch a DVD series like financial piece from the nineties and they were talking about setting up a budget and everything else yeah, that you imagine having these documents of paper out and you're trying to track bills and write them down. And it just, it just makes it very, very messy. I would encourage you to use a free software like mint mint.com. It is owned by the same people that do TurboTax. You can basically in update into it in one afternoon you can load it with every single credit card that you have, every single bank account that you have, and it can quickly aggregate every single transaction that you've had over the last several months and then look at those going forward. And then instead of you documenting it or really at this point, even coming up with a plan on where your money's going, all you want to know is what do I have coming into my accounts and what's going out? And then what is that? And so literally, instead of you just tracking it and writing it down, you're just categorizing it. You're saying, all right, I made this purchase. What was this purchase? I went to the grocery store. I went to Target. What did I get? Where is my money actually going? Now that you have a baseline, we can figure out what the next step is. Um, this now kind of comes back to the point that people are starting at this from different frames. You got to kind of figure out which one of these categories you fit into. Are you in massively in consumer debt? That That's one situation. And so in which case you are just trying to pay down debt and get to the point where your financial freedom clock starts, that point in time which you have no consumer debt. And now everything that you do, all those savings that you have is now going to essentially purchasing your financial independence. That's kind of one scenario. You have this other one that maybe they, they don't have any debt, but they don't have any assets either. They're just kind of paycheck to paycheck. They can afford their life, but that's kind of another frame. And then the other one would be they're making money 
and they have a very good salary, but they just don't have any direction for it. It's not going to any purpose. They, you know, those are just kind of three different places. Is there anything else, Brad, that I could add to that? Yeah, Jonathan, that's a pretty good overview of some scenarios. Of course, we could come up with a million different ones, right? The entrepreneur who maybe has some cash flow and is looking to just figure out how to how to save and how to get to FI. And also just maybe someone who's higher income that has a lot of monthly savings, but doesn't know where it's going to. So of course, there's an entire spectrum here. And clearly, I, I don't imagine at least you're going to go through each and every single one of them, but you're, you're setting up this background, right? Yeah. Not in the five minutes that you gave me for my elevator yeah. pitch. I'm pretty sure I've already burned through four minutes. So first yeah, yeah. rule of giving me a, a, a time limit is just understand that I'm going to blow through that time limit <laughs> <laughs> and then ask to keep going. <laughs> Jonathan being wordy. I'm very surprised. <laughs> so many great words. How do I choose? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So uh, the next we need to understand that like all of us are bound to this incredibly simple equation that what you earn minus what you spend is the difference. And you know, that's the gap. And we want to grow the gap. The problem with our consumer based society is that we think the gap just allows us to purchase more stuff, thereby eliminating the gap. There's different ways that we can tackle this. We can focus on the earning side of the equation. We can focus on the spend less side of the equation, or we can focus on the gap, which I like to think of as just optimization. It could be investing. It could be building a business, building a side hustle, whatever, however, whatever you want to do with it. But there's kind of three different ways that we can tackle it. The pillars of FI, which is an episode that we did in episode 21, which I will not use burn through my, I will not use my five minutes to like recycle right now. Give us the easiest ways that we can tackle these different equations. It just gives us like 10, 10 or so different levers that we can pull to either help us earn more, spend less, optimize the difference. I think the, the underpinning there though, is the savings rate in terms of knowing what it looks like to reach success. You don't have to do everything, but you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to make a different choice than you're making now if you want to get a different result. That's just ultimately what it comes down to. And depending on whether or not your problem is a spending problem or whether or not it's an income problem, the person that is paycheck to paycheck on a $100,000 a year salary is radically different than the person that's making $12 an hour and is paycheck to paycheck. The strategy has to reflect that because it is going to be obviously much harder to get to a 50% savings rate on a $12 an hour wage than it is on hundred K a year. Let's just Let's just be brutally honest about that for a second. So if we need to talk about career hacking, increasing income, changing jobs, finding a new career, whatever that may be for you, that person starting a side hustle, we need to have that conversation. And then we need to be willing for that person that's spending every single dime of hundred K a year salary. We need to be ready to have a different conversation for that individual. Once you figured out what your strategy is going to be, it's going to be persistence and following through on the plan and being willing to change as your circumstances change. And then finally, kind of what does it look like to succeed at this? If you can reach a point in time where you can hit a 50% savings rate, if you can maintain that savings rate of 50% for 10 to 15 years, just on your investments alone, you will reach a point in time where you have created for yourself this perpetual money-making machine and your investments can then sustain your lifestyle for the remainder of time. Like that's kind of a great baseline. The crazy thing is it gets even more fun and more complicated than that because ultimately what we're talking about is creating passive income. And that can be through investments, which as defined by that 50% savings rate, you can achieve in like a 10 to 15 year window or we could come at it from another perspective. We could build up a rental real estate portfolio that's supplementing a portion of that, or we could start a business, albeit one that we're passionate about and we're willing to work in, or another one that we found a way to scale ourselves out of that's producing a level of income for us. All of those can supplement and reduce the amount that we need in that investment bucket. But that's kind of the options that we have. We can pick from real estate, we can pick from business ventures or side hustles, and we can pick from our paper assets or our investment accounts. Those are our options. The fun thing is like we can explore these piecemeal and we can slowly adapt them into our life. Going back to the mindset, as you get rid of good, you can make way for great. Let's pivot with that a little bit and just basically say, as we get better in one aspect of our life, it opens up opportunities for us and others. And by staying on this journey, we're constantly highlighting the ideas, the patterns, the techniques that people in our community have successfully leveraged to get themselves off the hamster wheel, off the grind, and create a lifestyle by design within a 10 to 15 year window. It's just fun to be a part of the conversation. I think it is the most addictive conversation you could be a part of. That was a really good overview, Jonathan, for sure. It's hard not to let the mindset 
come into this because that is what it's all about. So I think you did a really admirable job there of, of weaving the two. And for a lot of people, it's just accumulating these small wins. I think while it's easy to say, earn more money or start a business, for a lot of people, that's not something that can happen tomorrow necessarily. They can obviously get on the path and they can start looking at other jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But I think for most people, if they felt like they could earn more money tomorrow, they probably would do it. So for me, at least, and of course, everybody approaches Phi in a different perspective. Like for me, the earning more money is slightly secondary when you're getting started on the path to looking at your expenses and seeing what little wins you can rack up. Can you cut your expensive T-Mobile cell phone and get a phone through Republic Wireless, like my wife Laura and I have, and it's under $20 a month for each of us, and the service is fantastic, right? So that saves us a couple of hundred dollars per month, actually. I mean, then that's almost a couple thousand dollars per year just for a simple choice that has no negative impacts on our lives. Then can you look at your grocery bill and maybe shave off a couple hundred dollars between going out to eat and buying fancy prepared foods at the grocery store and instead make some nice, healthy, nutritious meals at home that can save you both money, of course, and time by preparing them in batches, right? So you're clawing back time in your life there. That's a couple thousand dollars a year easily. So those are two simple choices that you can make that open up a little bit of that gap. And then you start getting into some of the bigger things, right? The cars, maybe looking at your house. Hey, do I need this big a house? Is this something that I could contemplate changing? You know, you can start cutting the cord. You can do just all of these things that eventually it's not so small anymore, that gap, right? You're opening up potentially tens of thousands of dollars and you're not impacting your quality of life negatively at all. So the whole point is creating this savings and then stocking this money away. And we suggest really maxing out your pre-tax buckets. So your 401ks, your 403bs, 457s, traditional IRAs, those type of, of vehicles, HSAs are another. And because that lowers your taxable income and thus your tax liability this year. And again, it's, it's control what you can control. By maxing out those buckets, you control your tax liability to a large degree. And for many people in our community, you can drive your tax liability down very, very low. I mean, to the point where your effective tax rate is under 10%. I mean, that's not implausible at all. Then you start saying, okay, how do I invest? It sounds so difficult. Well, a lot of people, and, and we believe in low cost index funds, that you don't have to outsmart the market. You don't need to be some investing genius. You just need to match the market and you need to do it for the lowest fees possible. So therefore, we pick low cost index funds and you can find a great assortment from Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, and it's hard to go wrong with any of them. We, Jonathan, you and I love the total stock market index fund, but certainly people of good faith can decide between that, the S&P 500, some bonds, let's say some international. I mean, th there are very smart people who think that we're simplistic by just going for the total stock market index fund, but you and I are, are quite content with that. So that is not our place to say precisely it has to be X. That's, that's not what we do here at Choose FI. But what we believe is that you're not going to beat the market over 30 to 50 years. So why even try? Just go for low cost index fund investing. So that's how I would approach that roadmap on day one is look at your expenses track it in personal capital or mint and see what's really there. See what's going on. Track your net worth. What do you have in assets? What do you have in liabilities? And then try to shave off some expenses and get those wins. And eventually it becomes fun. This becomes like a fun hobby that, wow, you mean I'm winning at life by doing this, right? I'm winning at life by maxing out my 401k, by putting money into Vanguard after that. All of a sudden, you have $20,000, $50,000, $200,000 saved up in your net worth, and then FI doesn't seem so implausible anymore, right? You can see how it becomes almost a mathematical certainty over 
a 10 to 20 year period, you know, depending on your, your savings rate, of course. And I think that's how I would approach it personally, but of course you have to get that mindset down. So there's lots of things to consider, but hopefully tell you that that was a, a helpful intro. I think as far as like one particular roadmap, I know David is trying to do something like that over at Phiology.com, and that's something that we hope to partner with him there. And I think he's putting something together that's fascinating. So that would be my intro if I had to encapsulate it in a few minutes. And coming back to mindset, let's just go back to Montana Money Adventures. That is, would be a wonderful website to spend some serious time if you're trying to get your mindset game right. And uh, Carrie left this message and she said, mind blowing, not sure how I didn't find her before, but I've been binge reading her blog since I finished the episode and I have a few things right off the bat that I love. And I'm going to need to think about how to incorporate minimalism into my life. Jody says, it was great to hear from someone with a large family and a moving testimony of what life can be like when you lean in and do the tough thing. So uh, yeah, just to round that up, Jillian, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we just, we appreciate you being willing to share your story with us. All right. Well, we did have some other questions that we wanted to cover. I got a voicemail from Jason asking about travel rewards. I'm going to go ahead and play that next. Hey guys, really enjoy your show. My name is Jason Smith, Mobile, Alabama. Just stumbled upon it about a week ago after reading Vicki Robbins' book, um, Your Money or Your Life. Been listening to some of your podcasts. Enjoy it. So keep it up. But I uh, just wanted to ask if there's any way you could do like an update on the the travel rewards. Because it's April 2018. We just looked at it. Me and my wife already have a preferred and a reserve in her name, but nothing in my name. And uh, we're benefiting, you know, a little bit from the, but we've already gotten the bonus and looking for what to do next. There's a lot of things that have changed, such as certain bonuses. And a representative the other day told us you could no longer have two Sapphire products at the same time in the same name. So how does that play into your strategy? And also with the Southwest cards, they've lowered the bonuses to, I think, 40000 from 50000 And the business, I think, is still sixty. And I um, was a little confused on the uh, Southwest Rapid Rewards versus Chase Ultimate Rewards. Are those interchangeable or not? And if not, what's your strategy on all this in transferring points? Or do you just try to plan your trips in regards to using those so I don't know if you could just give maybe a quick update on some of that stuff for uh, for this year. Thank you. All right, Jason. So yeah, glad you're enjoying the show and travel rewards update for 2018. We've we've tried to kind of keep people updated here and there when new information comes out. But since you asked a bunch of questions, I'll answer them specifically since a lot of them do tie in directly to to some changes we've seen. Well, first is like you mentioned the Chase Sapphire Preferred and Chase Sapphire Reserve. Those are two fantastic cards. We highly recommend both of them. But as you correctly said, you cannot get the bonus on both of them now at the same time. Chase has basically changed their rule. So you previously could get a bonus on each card every 24 months. So it was 24 months from when you previously got the bonus. That was their rule. But now they've made it that basically the Sapphire products are considered one card in essence for that particular rule. So you cannot get a bonus on the Sapphire Preferred and then six months later get the Sapphire Reserve. It just does not work that way. So you do need to wait that 24 months in between. That's obviously an unfortunate development because those Chase Ultimate Rewards points are our favorite rewards currency. But the good point is there are many ways to get ultimate rewards. Clearly, one of the Sapphire options will be in many people's futures. I think we generally recommend the preferred. That one has a $95 annual fee that is waived the first year. So this is at the time of recording this on July 17th, 2018. And the Sapphire Reserve has a much more significant $450 annual fee. And that is not waived the first year. But that said, the reserve does have a $300 annual travel credit. So any travel that you purchase with that reserve card, you get a $300 just straight off the top credit. 
So in essence, that means there's a $150 net annual fee. That's much more plausible, especially because you do get priority pass and you do get reimbursed for global entries. So there are some real significant reasons why you'd go for the reserve. So I think people have to ultimately make that decision. But our general advice is that since it's hard for people to pay that $450 upfront, the Sapphire Preferred is usually the better option, but I think people need to, to really consider that. But yeah, going back to Ultimate Rewards, there's the Chase Inc. Business Preferred card, which currently has an 80,000 point bonus. And now if you have a, a business of any sort, this is something to strongly, strongly consider. Uh, there are also other Chase Business cards that have Ultimate Rewards points. There's the Chase Inc. Business Cash Card, and there's a new one called the Chase Inc. Business Unlimited also, which I guess they say they're $500 bonuses, but they're actually 50,000 Ultimate Rewards points, which when coupled with one of their premium cards, like the Inc. Business Preferred or the Sapphire, either of the Sapphire options, the Reserve or Preferred, those become the transferable Ultimate Rewards points that we love so much. And that ties into Jason's question of what do you do with like kind of the interplay between ultimate rewards and Southwest? And this is kind of a, a take a step back type thing where ultimate rewards points are extremely valuable because of their flexibility. You can either book travel through the ultimate rewards portal that can be pretty useful and somewhat valuable, but generally the way to get the most value is to transfer the points to one of their 13 airline and hotel partners. And we love Southwest, Hyatt, United, and British Airways the most. So those are my four favorite transfer partners. And those ultimate rewards points then become miles and points at those programs. So you no longer have ultimate rewards. You transfer some or all of them in whatever denomination you want over to that airline and hotel rewards program, and they become those miles. So you can get a significant amount more value that way. That's something certainly to consider. Jason asked about the Southwest cards and the bonuses change all the time in these cards. So me giving you a bonus right now would, would provide no real value, but I've seen between 40 and 60,000 Southwest miles on those cards in general terms. And they do seem to change multiple times per year. So I wouldn't be too concerned if you see a 40,000 mile bonus on the day you're checking, a month or two later, it could be up to 50 or 60. So I think that's for the companion pass most people are looking to get, where if you earn 110,000 Southwest miles in one calendar year, you earn this amazing companion pass, which then is good through December 31st of the following year. So that enables you to bring a companion of your choice on that flight with you for free, which is astounding. That is a really cool thing to go for, though it is important to note that the transfers from Ultima Rewards do not count towards that companion pass, towards earning that companion pass. Once you have the companion pass, those become Southwest miles and you can still take your companion with you for free. But it's important that transfers from Ultima Rewards do not count towards earning the companion pass. And then two other things jump out to me as far as updates go. The Starwood Preferred Guest program, which we have loved for many, many years because it's been, along with Hyatt, I consider those the two best award charts for hotels. That is actually going away on August 1st, 2018. So Marriott purchased Starwood a couple of years ago, and it's taken them a while to really put everything together. And unfortunately, yeah, on August 1st, the Starwood program will cease to exist as far as I understand. So all the Starwood hotels are now on the Marriott award chart. And I've seen some positive things, but I've also seen some negatives, like the uh, Disney World plan that I put together. It used to be a fairly reasonable amount of, let's say 10,000 Starwood points per night, or more, more recently, 12,000 Starwood points per night, because it's three to one to Marriott. That would be roughly 36,000 Marriott points is what you'd expect, but they hiked it up to 50,000 points per night. So that was a really unfortunate circumstance. But for the most part, the award chart, it was not as terrible as, as people were hoping. So 
you cannot get the Starwood card with a big Starwood bonus anymore, but there are multiple Marriott cards. So that's that's a positive thing. And then in really recent news, the Barkley card Arrival Plus just came back. They had actually removed that product entirely a couple months back. That was really unfortunate because along with the Capital One Venture card, which we love, those are what I call fixed value cards, where basically you just pay for the travel with those credit cards and you get to wipe out some or all of the expense, depending on how many points you have after the fact. And they're fixed value because those points are worth one cent per point. So basically 50,000 points are worth $500. But if you can find great deals on travel or Airbnb or something like that, you can just pay for it with your venture card and then wipe out the expense afterwards. So they're really, really great cards for a lot of people who don't want to go through the hassle of booking a traditional frequent flyer mile seat or a hotel night. There's some value there. And yeah, this Arrival Plus card just gives you a second great option as far as fixed value personal cards go. And of course, there's always the Capital One Spark Miles for business card if you're looking for a fixed value card for business. So yeah, I mean, that's what jumps out to me right now. I don't know, Jonathan, do you have anything to add? Well, just one question. So I do have a Starwood card. I have the, what is it? The MX Starwood Preferred. Anything that I should be aware of specifically with that card? Sorry, super selfish question. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good question. I truthfully do not know what's going to happen to the actual card. I suspect, though I should know this, I suspect you'll just start earning Marriott points from the card and it'll just be basically three times whatever you were earning before. That is complete guess. There's no knowledge there whatsoever. But what I know will happen is your Starwood points, which I think is really what you're asking, yes. is, hey, I've got points sitting in my Starwood preferred guest account. What's going to happen to them? They are going to become Marriott points. So they'll basically take your points. Let's say you have 30,000 sitting there. They will become 90,000 Marriott points. Okay. So if really simple. So if you don't have a Marriott account already, what I would suggest is just quickly creating one just to cut down on hassle of like them creating an account for you. And then maybe you not being able to log in and having to make a phone call, just take a minute and go to the Marriott site and just create a free rewards account. And then you can actually link up those accounts for free. Obviously just link your Starwood to your Marriott That'll make it a lot more seamless. And since it's basically just a couple of days before August 1st anyway, you might as well just transfer your points over to Marriott rather than them do it. So that's what I would suggest to people. But otherwise, they'll pretty much take care of that for you. Awesome. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty solid update. And we will, if you're listening to this show live, we will, as updates come down the pipeline, we will always try to keep you up to date using the Friday Roundup as a vehicle to let you know what the latest and greatest is on that account. So, hey, thank you so much, Jason, for the question. And uh, I have one more for you, Brad. Now, this is not travel rewards related. This is actually a challenge that we got on our limiting belief about golf that we came up with that we talked about on this past week's Friday Roundup, uh, which I believe was 83R. We were basically talking about how to pick your hobbies. Tyler felt strongly that we had pigeonholed ourselves and we were not thinking creatively enough about how you could both enjoy golf and do it in a way that checks all the, the check boxes that you could want for a awesome hobby. Hello, Brad and Jonathan. My name is Tyler and I'm 24 years old. I would like to add some input on your limiting belief that golf has to be an expensive hobby. Golf is what I value and prioritize, but there is always a way to make smart financial decisions no matter what you do. From age 18 to 20, I worked at a private golf course. I would wash clubs, get golf carts ready, and set up the driving range. This was a great summer job, which included above minimum wage pay, roughly $20 a day in tips, and the ultimate benefit, free golf. Now, I am working my 9 to 5. I, like a true FIer, created a spreadsheet of all the golf courses within a 30-minute drive of my office. The spreadsheet has detailed Things such as yearly fees, the time it takes to drive from work and home, and the miles needed to drive from work and home. I also added a comment section to include if it was a 9 or 18 hole course and whether certain amenities were included, like a golf cart. As you can imagine, I found courses ranging from $750 a year to $5,000. Better yet, there are discounted memberships for people in different age brackets. 
There are also severe discounts for people who only play in the evening, also known as twilight hours. The course I'm currently playing has a monthly membership. The cost is $40 per month, and with that, you can hit two big buckets of range balls per day. With unlimited access to the chipping and the putting green, the monthly membership affords me the ability to play 18 holes anytime after 5 p.m. for $10, which includes a golf cart. For someone that lives in New England, the length of the golf season can be quite short, about six months. To calculate the total cost of my golf membership, I first multiplied six months by $40 per month to get a minimum cost of $240 to practice and improve my game. I plan to play two times during the week, which I then multiply by four weeks per month, then multiply that by another six months, and that equals $480. So my total golf membership for six months of pure enjoyment would be a maximum all-in price of $720. More than half the times I decide to walk while I play, which is a great form of exercise, especially after sitting at my desk all day. One thing I forgot to mention, the course I play at is ranked in the top 10 public courses in all of New England. Talking about the social boxes to check off, golf is a great way to meet new people and gives you plenty of time to get to know someone. Now, for networking, I cannot tell you how many people I have met on the golf course who say, you should connect with my good friend who works at, insert some high-level corporation. I will give you his slash her contact information and text him slash her for you. Brad and Jonathan, it all comes down to what you value in life. Jonathan, I do not have a child of my own right now, but when it, the time comes, I know golf may not be something I value at that point. Brad, I am trying to master golf as you are Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Everyone is unique, and what is important to uh, one person can certainly not matter one iota to another. Lastly, I enjoy the podcast where you expressed you are a valuist because it finally helped me put the words to what I am. Love the podcast. Keep up the amazing content. Thank you. All right, Brad. Well, it's hard to argue against that. It certainly is. That was a great <laughs> voicemail. Yeah, I think he nailed it on everything. And honestly, I think the hobby checkbox is just, it's kind of like a framework at looking at where you're spending your time. You can kind of use it as a litmus test. It's not the absolute final say in anything, but it just kind of helps you place things. And going back to this idea of getting rid of good to make way for great, I think the hobby checkbox kind of does that for us. And if you can take any hobby, it doesn't mean that hobby is going to meet the same checkboxes for everybody, right? It could do different things for different people. But I think whatever it is that you're talking about, if you kind of take it through, what is this adding? Is this adding value to my life? Is this adding value, you know, in proportionate to the amount of time and money that I'm potentially putting into this? If you can kind of take it through that gauntlet, through that checkbox, through that checklist, and at the end of it, you say, I'm very satisfied with the value this is adding to my life. How much more confident are you about that decision? And how does that indicate that as a person, you're being intentional with your choices as opposed to buying in to some sort of crazy societal structure that you didn't even realize was being imposed upon you? Yeah, no, I totally hear you. And and Tyler's right for calling out limiting beliefs. Of course, you were just using golf as shorthand for something that people just spend a lot of money on without thinking. But if you're going to go through the time and effort that Tyler did to create these spreadsheets and think about ways to save by, I guess, working for the clubs or some just like, then of course there was a way to do this inexpensively if that's something you value, right? And clearly he does. So that's a slam dunk choice for him. And I would never second guess that ever. I mean, it just would never cross my mind. So, I mean, that is as rational of a choice as it comes, but Jonathan, it almost reminds me like your limiting belief of golf is expensive is is similar to what you kind of made fun of me about my limiting belief about how expensive college was, you know, when we talked about it a year ago. That in our minds, it's kind of shorthand for, oh, this is something expensive and it's hard to figure out ways. But as many people have talked about in the intervening year, there are lots of ways to, to save on college. And yeah, Tyler just showed us if you want to save money on golf, there are ways to do it, even as simply as going to twilight hours. That was just like a cool little little hack, right? And should have been 
fairly obvious. So for all that I've made fun of you personally, Jonathan, about golf, hey, if you want to go to golf during twilight hours, that's that's a pretty good little uh, way to to figure this out, right? Yeah, I can work on my horizontal game as I walk back and forth across the court, getting my ball out of the weeds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tyler, thanks so much for the call, man. That was great. And speaking of golf, man, let's talk about disc golf for a second. So we had a special giveaway this past week. We interviewed in episode 83, Cody Berman from Fly to Fi, who started a company, Arsenal Disc, and has a website at arsenaldisc, with the S at the end, dot com, arsenaldisc.com. And for people that aren't familiar with this, apparently there is an alternative to traditional golf that uses a form of Frisbee instead. It's a, it's a kind of a type of a harder round disc There are lots of public and private courses around the country, significantly less expensive than traditional golf and probably a pretty cool alternative if you haven't heard of it before. Anyways, we wanted to support Cody and we purchased two sets of these discs and we offered them up to our community in kind of in the drawing format that we use at the end of every show. And we had a bunch of responses and we are going to announce our winners today. And so we pulled the good old randomizer out. Brad, who won the first set? All right. So yeah, we put it into the randomizer and the first winner is Dylan. And actually, Brad, Dylan left this on Stitcher, which I just wanted to take one second and highlight it because we don't give Stitcher enough love. We always say, if you want to leave us a review, go to iTunes. You know, if you do not use iTunes, if you do not participate in the Apple ecosystem and you still want to leave us a review, you could absolutely do so. Just go to Stitcher and there is a review set up there and you can just follow the exact same process to enter these drawings in the future if you are wanting to participate in that. But thank you so much, Dylan, and enjoy the disc. We have one more. Our second winner is TJ. All right, guys. Awesome. Danny will be reaching out to you to get those set of discs in your hands. Thank you so much for participating. And then, Brad, we do have our regular book drawing as well this week. How many winners do we have for that? Yeah, Jonathan, we have two winners for the books. And the first winner is Matt. And Matt said, the best podcast out there, financial or otherwise. Do you enjoy waking up in a panic, not having time for breakfast and being too busy to take your spouse's call at work? Me neither. What about having to hurry your kids off to school and activities, getting caught in traffic, arriving home late each day and scarfing down an unsatisfying dinner, only to then drift in and out of restless nights of sleep due to stress? No. Not your idea of fun, I hear you. And if you feel the way I do, that this middle-class American dream is starting to give you nightmares, then this is the podcast that we should all be listening to. Brad and Jonathan from Choose FI have open and honest conversations about personal finance concerning real, practical, important life skills that for some reason, no one ever really bothers to talk about in life. They find a way to draw in those of us who may be tempted to turn glossy-eyed and run the other way when anything financial is discussed. From cutting grocery bills and paying off student debt to investing in index funds and learning how to reap credit card rewards for free travel, these guys are educating their listeners in ways few such programs can. And guess what? It doesn't cost you a thing. In only listening to a handful of episodes to date, I can say with great certainty that I've already learned and put into action some habits that will truthfully change the course of my life. I encourage you to listen and do the same. Wow, that is an incredible review. Thank you so much for for taking the time to leave that, Matt. All right, and Jonathan, we did have another winner, and the winner is Sherry. Jerry says, beyond anything I hoped for, Brad and Jonathan have taken the guesswork out of financial independence by leaving no stone unturned and providing step-by-step ideas that can be implemented by anyone in any walk of life or income bracket to achieve financial independence. Chooseify has had a positive impact on my own financial well-being that will continue to compound for years and possibly generations to come. Providing an infinite number of actionable tips, Chooseify is truly a blueprint for FI. I am no longer frightened by taxes or investments as they they have laid them out in a way that is simple and understandable. And Chooseify is not just about money, it's about happiness and pursuing your passions. If you're interested in ending your financial bondage and would rather have your money work for you, this is the solution you've been looking for. Solid to the core, Chooseify is the real deal. You're a student in the state of Ohio. I love it. The whole state is taking a turn to FI. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the provider know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast. 
where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.